deeply stirred by watching all of you arrive. Um, my emotions are varied. My memory bank pulls up many historical moments, Kodak moments, if you wish, or these days, iPhone 6 moments. Um, I think in its simplicity, there's something of the heart of God that gets revealed when a group of men, men and women pay a price for a higher calling, most times of which they will get no or limited fruit themselves. And I just looked around the room. I see Josh. He's going to be planting in Vancouver, Washington within the next year. Brad's just moved into the valley. He's planting in the valley right now, uh, although the launch date is in, in just a little bit. Grant has just planted um, running around the room quickly. Bert, your launch is Sunday, um, which, is, which is very cool. Uh, Gabe goes back, and you're going to be planting within the next six months or something. Um, Alan's leaving for Santa Barbara. He's planting in Santa Barbara. Brad, we haven't met yet, but Brad's going to be planting or looking to plant in Nicaragua. Um, and uh, you guys, Anthony, and I'm serving in a church plant in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And, of course, some guys haven't uh, arrived as yet. Um, and P.S., those who haven't arrived, I mean, we still have to pay for the meals and everything. So that's a little awkward, but that just is what it is. Um, I'm so deeply stirred by it. What I want to do is take about 30 minutes and just frame our time together. Dana's going to come up here afterwards. Uh, I've asked her just to speak about the one we worship as a mission-initiating father. She's going to speak for a little bit, and then we're going to worship. So we're going to throw it on its head a little bit. The worst that can happen is that it really sucks and I take the blame and the hit for it. The best that can happen is we really encounter God in response to the word and the scripture. And then John Mark, who's increasingly a dear, dear friend, love him, love his family. I will be up with you in uh, next weekend. Um, so, uh, and they, they just, they honestly, uh, I texted John Mark and just as a reminder said, our primary driving idea is mission, but what I want him to do is give us his heart. Uh, honestly, I don't know of a church, an inner city church of size, that is so missionally effective as is this. And it's been intentional, and it's been about, about four years or something that you guys have gone hard after the whole, how do we be a church on mission in Portland? And uh, so I really don't mind what his subject is. When Zonavan signs a young 30-something-year-old to a four-book deal, you know he's got something to say. And I don't really mind what his subject is. He's going to deposit something significant. And then, of course, just the other friends who are going to be speaking. Tony and Kath were on the original uh, deal to speak tonight from Adelaide, Australia. They've just come back from Bali. She has dengue. Den dengue? Does he, a fever? And it's hospitalized. And uh, Tony called me on Sunday to say, she's down, I'm still coming. Texted me overnight to say, they won't release me. We have to be quarantined as well. And uh, so he was seriously disappointed not to be here. But uh, those of you who are here, I'm uber stoked. Would you grab your Bibles, please? Go to 1 Samuel 22. Thanks, my love. My name is Chris Finan. For those of you who don't know... And I just feel incredibly honored to be part of this great adventure um, where God keeps surprising us and delighting us. Mm. 1 Samuel 22, I'm reading from the ESV that may differ slightly from your trans, uh, translation, but it doesn't matter, we get the essence of the story. <coughs> David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Or Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, loved the sense of brotherhood and family and friendship, and everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul or discontented, the NIV says, gathered to him. And he became commander over them, and there were about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. I love the vulnerability of a people on the move. A mobile people who don't move when we have the path clearly spelt out, but we move in faith that God has nudged us, and we will discover the journey 
en route. And it will always be more amazing, more crazy, more taxing, more demanding, more challenging, more sacrificial than when we set out. Ask any lady who has a baby. Everyone uh, comes and applauds them for their pregnancy and there's much hooting and hollering. And they will say at the end of the pregnancy, I never knew it was like this. A year after having the baby, I never knew it was like this. And God wisely is silent on what it will cost us. But the sanity is when that little kid smiles at a mother holding the child to her breast. It's worth the pain and the trauma. God wisely is silent on things that he could tell us about, but we would say no because we don't have the grace or faith to deal with it then. We will have the grace and faith to deal with it when it appears. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Father, I just ask now for incredible wisdom, humility, and authority. Uh, frame this time with us, I pray, through your Holy Spirit, that uh, you will do wonders. You, only you can take the aspirations of the individual or the couple, can take the desires and wishes of a church, can take a broader brotherhood and weave answers to questions, bring clarity to concerns, bring faith to vulnerabilities, through your word. Only you can do such a marvelously mysterious thing. And I ask today that you will do precisely that amongst us. Be it through me, be it through Dana, through John Mark and others. Uh, we submit ourselves to your wondrous ways in Jesus' name. Uh, D David's an amazing story. And I'll just briefly tell you what you already know. But he was the youngest son, a forgotten by his father. Uh, when the prophet came to say, I want to meet all your sons, the father forgot about him. Oops, I got so many sons. Oh yeah, he's out there looking after the sheep. He was hated by the king even though he was invited into the court. He was chased away from the court and moved from favor to foe. He became the enemy of the state. He became a branded terrorist for what he believed. And um, I think sometimes in our modern world we forget the power of martyrdom even though there are many of our brothers and sisters who are experiencing global martyrdom right now. We live in the safety and sanctity, facing huge challenges in the Americas for sure, but still living in a greater measure of favor than foe. Um, and then, of course, his best friend, the son of his enemy, decided rather than walk with him, which he said was the intention, he walked, uh, Jonathan did, with his father. David was poorly readied for his assignment. He was a shepherd. He was a harpist, a poet, a slingshot specialist. Don't fear being ill-equipped for the adventure. One of the things I love looking around the room is how many of us are not Bible college or uh, Bible school or seminary trained. Do I believe in that? Of course I do. But don't let that be a point of disqualification. Very little of what David did prepared him for the skills he needed, but readied him for the heart he required. And then, of course, the great launch team that God gave him was they were people in distress. Uh, the NIV says, or one of the translations, maybe the Amplified said, they suffered hardship. They were losers, the message says. So God said, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the launch team together for you, David, that's going to look exactly like it. I'm going to put losers around you. Secondly, those who were in debt. I love the message Eugene Peterson said they were vagrants. They had nothing. They were homeless. Imagine if God says, I've got the team for you, Brad, just for the valley. I'm going to put the homeless in your team. And he's probably going to be, and I don't want to be unkind to you, Brad, but he's probably going to be a little bit bummed saying, God, um, you know, can we have some people some money or something? Just one guy have a car. Can we have one guy that has a car? I was just watching them bring in the equipment, and I was reminded of um, Derek and Kath, who planted in New York from Cape Town, South Africa. They were young. They were in their 20s. He had, he, he had a homeschooled high school certificate. And I say that because sometimes it's not necessarily the, the weightiest. Sometimes. And um, he, they arrived with $100 in their pocket to plant a church. And uh, the way they had to get their equipment on, and Derek preached, and she led the worship, and they had a baby. And uh, they would put all this equipment 
on the, on the tube, carry it down the stairs, because they didn't have an elevator, carry it down five loads of uh, stairs, put it on the, in the, the, uh, the tube, and then get across to their gathering space, set it all up, greet the people. She led the worship. He preached. She would go and do the kids' ministry while he was preaching. Then when everyone had gone home, they would pack it all down. See, some of you have to realize that you really are spoiled, <laughs> you know? You haven't got $100, you've got $100,000. You haven't got losers, vagrants. You have got real people who are successful, who believe in you, who actually want to put money, time, and effort, and energy behind you. I love it when God takes the impossible and makes it possible. And they were the discontented. They were bitter in soul, the ESV says. The, the, um, Eugene Peterson speaks of misfits. What a great launch team. We are driven, dear friends, please hear me. We are driven by a culture of celebrityism and size. Big is good, small is bad. Big is successful, small is embarrassing. Big is desired, small is to be avoided at all costs. But I want to say, if we're in a journey such as the one we're on, we have to allow the Spirit of God, if nothing else, to shape and mold our thinking, because if that is driven, that drives us and drives our culture, we will not view what we're doing with any sense of significance. Can I remind us of Paul, who said it this way, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things in the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things in the world to shame the strong. Can I say that again? A vulnerability moment. I know I come across strong. I don't know why. I just do. They tell me that. My son said to me the other day, he said, Dad, you know, my friends are scared of you. And I'm like, but he keep talking because, I, you know, he said, look, Dad, with the girls, Dana's my daughter, she'll be ministering in a moment. He said, you know, it was fine when the girls were around because it kind of, all the vagrant suitors, all those who just wanted to kiss and cuddle and say goodbye, they never came near out my sisters, he said, because, you know, you looked really scary. He said, he said but Dad, you still look scary. So then I had to go with Meryl and I had to have the scary conversation. So why do people think I'm scary? I, I don't really know. I don't, I, I, it's the only face I have. I don't have another face. It's the one God gave me. It's Germanic. It's, it's African. It's Rover. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But it, it's the one I've got. Yeah, so, so the next day I picked Tian up at school and I was waving at all the other kids. Hi, my happy face. Happy me. Happy hi. Hi, smiley. See? See, happy? Happy my son, Knuckles, you know. <laughs> and he likes, what's all this about, Dad? I says, my happy face. Your friends are going to like me now. I'm, I'm, I'm this all new Chris, you know. Not the one who's always assessing and discerning and carries authority. This is all new happy me that don't care. I'm going to put on my surfer hat. I'm just going to be Southern California. I'm not going to care at all about anything but myself. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. That's... That's not the way we are in Southern California. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the wise. Brothers and sisters, we have to, if we're going to engage in a story that has impact, we have to allow our lenses to be revisited, reshaped, um, that, that God has to chiropractically adjust our mindsets, that God loves the weak, God loves the foolish, God loves the low, God loves those who have nothing, bring nothing, have no claim. We can't boast about anything. All too often, especially in some fun adventures, some fun church planting adventures, all too often we default back to we need celebrities, we need size, we need big, we don't need small, and we miss a great moment for gospel proclamation and God glory giving, if I can use it that way. Uh, I'm going to steal one of Rob's stories, then he'll have to find another one. But he was just telling me of the one village Rob's been working into Zimbabwe for a dozen years or more, whatever, however long. And just how the gospel has had an impact in the one town where no one goes. In fact, the government in Zimbabwe asked the people not to live there. It's so barren, it's, with, it's devoid of anything of value. And this community has stayed there. And Doomy went in there, preached the gospel, people got saved. But the one story I want to tell you that impacted me while we were chatting, and Rob and I and Linda and Meryl and I were friends for I don't know how long. But when Doomy went in the first time, a number of things happened. One, that the men had multiple wives. And two, that the, the huts were designed that the men slept on the top 
and the woman slept at the bottom so that if the lions come, they would take the wives and not the husbands. I mean, that's obvious. That's how we've designed our houses too. <laughs> but seriously, that's how it was designed because a man can have many wives, but a wife can't have many husbands. And so it was through the proclamation of the gospel, they didn't sit down and say, okay, now that you're a Christian, choose which wife you want. I mean, how do you handle that? What do you do with that? But what they started doing is preaching the wonder of marriage as a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. And so what transpired is that the first thing they saw was that the houses started different architecture. That the men started taking their, man, their, their biblical responsibility to protect and love and care for their wives. And no longer were they sleeping upstairs, but they were sleeping amongst the wives. A great kingdom victory. And then the younger generation, because they've been ministering in there for 10 years the young men are no longer choosing multiple wives. They're marrying one woman for a lifetime. God takes the low. God takes the, those who have nothing so that no human being can boast in the presence of God. Zechariah 4.10, do not despise the day of small beginnings. I was just thinking this morning while I was praying and running through my message, and I've got to move quickly. But um, I was just thinking of the early days. I remember the first time we met like this. I was 24. Meryl was still a college student, 21. We had a group about this size. And I remember we had this huge dream. Oh, God, could we ever impact South Africa? It was apartheid years. Mandela was in prison. Racism reigned supreme both in the heart and the socioeconomic practices. And, and the political architecture was around that. We thought, God, could we change a nation? Could we change the nation? Could racism go? Could the, the economic structure be realigned that the rich don't get richer? We haven't got that right. And the poor don't get poorer. And I remember watching Mandela walk out of prison weeping in 1994, was it? 92. I remember weeping as I watched him walk with, uh, what was his wife's name? Winnie. Winnie. I remember sitting there weeping and thought, God, all the days we prayed and fasted and cried out. For, oh God, could you change this nation? And Mediba, the father of the nation, who came pre proclaiming a message of reconciliation rather than civil war. I remember, I remember men and women being burnt on the streets, then putting tires over, pouring petrol over them, lighting them up as these, as these human bonfires on street corners were raging. And we thought civil, and, and forgive me, but some American prophets came and prophesied doom and gloom over the nation. And I honestly, I was furious. I thought to with you go back to america stop these ridiculous prophecies god loves this nation god has a commitment to this nation we have prayed and we have fasted and we've cried out we have nothing the rand is weak we have a poor economy but we're going to cry out to god and god will influence this nation when, when madiba walked out of prison i remember sitting there weeping I said god it was worth it it was worth it but a handful of us, just like this, that what could it look like if we agreed on a global adventure? What could it look like if we could see churches planted in the nations of the world? And it was 1999, I sat down because I was running the magazine, and there were 60 nations of the world we were planting churches in. And who were we? A handful of people with no money. There were none wise, none noble. None, none of us had anything. There was no wealth. I just was so proud if I can steal your story, Matt. That once a year, it's nice preaching first, you can tell all the cool stories. <laughs> once a year, Matt has, for five years now, Matt, wherever you're hiding, they once a year they take an offering for the work outside of Anthem. Anthem's not going to benefit, it's for the work outside of that. They planted five years ago, and every year the money has gone up, as Andy has, wherever you are, Andy. But I won't steal Andy's thunder. And they had an offering yesterday, Sunday, five years in, Five years in, a small church plant that started an idea that's running and combined a few hundred people, I don't know, of $101,000. $101,000 for a church that's five years old that isn't a thousand people yet? That's when you sow into a people, let's live for reasons beyond ourselves. We don't exist for ourselves. Archbishop William Temple said that in 1896 or something. He said, the church is the only organization that lives for the benefit of its non-members. Oh, how that spun around, tragically. Okay, a quick, a quick story, and then I'm going to land with some mission pieces, and I think I have 10 minutes left. 
I am a lover of history. And so I have great fondness, not for the damage and trauma of military history, but of the leadership and the life and the, the kind of interrupted moments. And probably one of the great ones happened in 1415 this month. It's called the Battle of Agincourt in France. Well documented and popularized through Shakespeare's writings, Henry V, and marvelously represented with Kevin Brannigan, who played the role 20 years ago or something. It was the 75th of a 100-year war. Henry V was 27 years old. Don't you love that? A man could lead a nation, and I'm astounded by many who say, 27, oh, you can't be an elder yet, you're way too young. And I'm thinking, this man was leading a nation. He was leading thousands of men to battle, which meant people died. Oh, no, you, you're too young to plant churches. I'm like... He set off to France with 6,000 men. And one of the commentators said he was filled with ambition, keen for military glory, and passionate to reclaim France, which he believed he had the right to through marriage. He led an army, and I quote, of hunted rabble, suffering from dysentery, fever, starvation, and malnutrition. The Middle Ages. Europe was without nations. They were fiefdoms under these barons. Uh, this was amazing to me. One of the commentators said, or the commentators, I feel like I'm a theologian, said that cathedral builders had lost their faith. What an interesting line. 75 years into the Hundred Year War, cathedral builders had lost their faith. They stopped building cathedrals. Plague had ravaged the continent, and two armies faced each other. The Grand Marshal of the, of the French gathered together and chose the site for battle. Agincourt where the castle was in the background. They stopped Henry V from advancing to Calais, which would have been a safe place for him, and they basically surrounded him. He, by this stage, had 5,000 combatants, and what faced him were 25,000. He was outmuscled five to one. The French had 2,400 cavalry. The English had none. The French had 7,600 infantry. The English had 1,000. The French had 4,000 archers. The English had 5,000. The French had 1,500 crossbows. The English had none. It rained the night before the chosen battle. And when you see it, it's quite remarkable. There were two, there were two forests either side of this plowed turf. The English under Henry with this thin narrow line of combatants, 5,000 on the morning of the fight approximately, and facing this overwhelming cavalry charge of, 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 of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, armored cavalry, infantry overwhelmingly outnumbered with their few longbows. Now, I want us to understand this because it was a moment that was sublime in military history. I want us to understand that it's not the many who necessarily engage in successful combat. It's those who are illustrious and believe in the mission that they have. Can I quote Shakespeare? I think it'll sound quite cool with my South African accent. That's the only value, really. It's not in the Bible. It's not in history, but it's in Shakespeare. He which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made. And crowns for convoy put into his purse. We will not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. Crispian was where two brothers, twins, were martyred on the same day. They were killed together for their faith. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him in the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly in the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget, yea, all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feasts he did that day. Then our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford, Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucestershire, Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man tell his son. 
and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, for we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here. And had their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. The French paused. Confident in their arrogance that they were overwhelmingly outnumbered the English. But concerned that the muddy footing of a ploughed field under a night's rain. And Henry took the moment with great initiative and in the wood moved his long bows through till they reached that place where they could shoot their arrows. And he quietly moved his forces forward a little at a time and put stakes in the ground to protect them from the cavalry. And when the first, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When the first surge of arrows went from the longbows and started penetrating both horse and rider and infantry and archer, the French became unsettled and disquietened. And the initiative was no longer theirs. And some in anger and resentment and basically out of military control started advancing, which set forth all the other cavalry as they charged. The French lost 8,000 fatalities that day. The English, 100. Now, I love that story. I love its mood. I love its emotion. I love its passion. I love its reminder that God loves doing much with few. And I'm not saying God was with the English, although the English would. I'm not saying God was against the French, which the English would also agree with. <laughs> but Henry V was courageous. He was innovative, innovative. He used his strengths in fighting in a unique, surprising, and victorious way. I could tell you about the Battle of Rorkstrift, which very few of you would know about 1879 when 104 British soldiers were cornered between a mission station and a storehouse in the foothills of South Africa. 104 of them, red coats, faced 3,000 Zulu impis. If you ever get an opportunity, an old, badly made movie called Zulu will give you the picture. And the rousing, singing, stirring of the impis as they sang their songs before attacking, and they fought these 104 men for 11 hours. And the only way they could protect themselves was bags of maize and empty uh, biscuit tins that they filled with sand as one wave of Zulu Impi after the other came against them. The most Victoria Crosses ever given in a single English uh, military encounter, 11, were issued that day as brother fought with brother side by side as they literally fought wave upon wave of the Zulu Impi. Now, am I trying to rouse you? Of course I am. Am I trying to call you to a higher mission? Of course I am. Am I trying to get you to believe that there's more to this great kingdom story than the few who surround you who are distressed, in debt, and discontented? Of course I am. As Christopher Columbus said, men crossed the Atlantic primarily in search of gold, but they were also idealists. Please hear this. These adventurous young men thought they could transform the world for better. When Paul Johnson, when I read what Paul Johnson wrote, something inside of my heart stirred, if I can be ruthlessly honest with you. I see thousands of young men and women finding their way to ISIS, doing whatever is necessary because they want to be part of a story that can transform the world. And the only thing we can offer our young men and women is we can make you a life group leader one day if you really toe the line. If you come to five courses... And if you tithe and you do this, you, could, you do the other thing. And, and, and we, we, we wonder why the millennials are saying, you've got to be kidding me. Is that the best you've got to offer? Something inside of us is global enough when the gospel is well proclaimed that we put our hand up to a great adventure. We want to be part of something that changes the world. I was part of something. And for various reasons that aren't important, I stepped outside of that. But that resounding essence still pulsates within my heart this gospel well proclaimed catapults me to the nations jesus said that jerusalem judea and 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 samaria 
to the uttermost parts of the world. The gospel well preached will get me to put my hand up. I, I, my marriage is done differently. The way I raise my kids is different. The way I spend my money is different. My checkbook reflects it differently. My evenings look different because I've got a global story residing in my heart that's only for the rebellious and the passionate and the God-fearing. These adventurous young men thought they could transform the world for the better. Europe was too small for them, he writes, for their energies, their ambitions, and their visions. The mixture of religious zeal, personal ambition, and the lust for adventure, which inspired the generations of the Crusaders, was the prototype for the enterprise of the Americas. We Americans were launched by that mindset. I'm not discussing the imperialistic nature of it, the political nature of it, but the DNA seeding. That we have within our belly. Steve Jobs said this. Meryl sent this to me a couple of months ago. Yes to the crazy ones. And if I had a glass of wine I would hold it up now. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. That's why we're here. They're not fond of rules. I'm not. Give me a rule I'll break it. Honestly I'm not a rules guy. I don't find that. I understand you need a civilized society. I get that. But there's enough inside of me that wants to find a way outside of that rule. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I'm 57. I've got 20 years left. I want to give my life to that. I want to be crazy enough to think that with the brand of brothers, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, we can still change the world. I'm still racked by 7 billion people on the planet. 213 nations. I've just come from Ireland. I left limping. The sheer catastrophe of religious conflict that has stained a nation for millennia is creating such an overwhelming shadow over the church planters they can't even get beyond 50. And you know what? No one wants to go and serve them. Because they want to go to the cool, sexy churches that are big. Who wants to go and sit with a church that's been 15 for 10 years? No one. No one. I will make you an everlasting sure love for David, the prophet Isaiah wrote, because I made him a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. The Acts account says, I have found in David a man after my own heart who will do my will. Acts 13, 36, for David served the purposes of God in his own generation. Acts 15, 16, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. I don't know if we know what that is for sure. I've read many accounts and they're different. I know worship is in there. I know God authority is in there. I know the kingdom is in there. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is forcefully advancing. Violent men lay hold of it. There's room, guys and gals, for us to be tender warriors. Poet leaders who are so passionate for Jesus, so passionate for his bride, love his girl, and want to see men and women come to faith, who leak and bleed every day with those who do not know his precious name. I love worship, but eternity is going to be about worship. I love being in the Lord's presence, but we're going to have heaps of time in eternity around that. But we're not going to have time with those who do not know him. We aren't going to have time with those who are far away from him. We only have that time now. That's the privilege we have right now. I land with this. What is our mission? For the longest time, we've struggled to even give it a name. I understand it's necessity. But as Genesis, we're a group of like-minded friends together on mission. And the mission in its simplest form, when you put it under the Bunsen burner, is to plant key, healthy, thriving, maturing, influencing and multiplying churches. That's what we are. That's what we are. It's nothing fancy. 
It's not glitz and glamour. There's no bling involved. It's jolly hard work. It's sacrificial. It's laying down your life. It's not wanting what you want. It's wanting what Jesus wants in the lives of others. It's a DNA that includes an, a, a, a full embrace of the Scripture. The Scripture frames all that we do. It's about mateship, doing life with friends. That's why it's great to have guys like Rob that I've known forever. VP that I've known from when he was a schoolboy. We're in it for the long haul. We're going to do this over a long time. Dave, when I landed in 1995, Dave was the children's ministry worker at Christian Chapel. I love you, David. You're an amazing man. I do. I love you. It hasn't been easy. His wife's incredibly sick. She can do very little at home. Sorry, I'm tender. She can do very little at home, even with their son and nothing in the church. And you just keep pushing on, man. You're a hero, David. Come, Dana. Come minister to us, babe. We'll finish some of these other things this afternoon. 